there, there was something. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay, so for this uh, last talk this morning, let's go a bit uh, lower level in the kernel with Borislav about, and uh, speak about x86 instructions. And he made some personal exercise on it and he will explain uh, what he did. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. No? You can see the... Can I, oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Move it around over here, on the other way. So can we make it big now? Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So my name is Boris. Uh, I work for SUSE on one of the kernel teams. And I do x86 and RAS and everything else that's interesting. Um, right, so you're probably wondering, why is this guy doing x86 instruction encoding? I mean, this is everywhere it's documented already so you can go and look it up and, and it's and it's in the it's in the tool chain and 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 yeah everything so you can you can use object dump and, and you can know which instruction is so why I did it well before Sousa I was at AMD and um and there was this talk about yeah this instruction and that instruction and this and and and, and we have to do that blah, blah blah and I always wanted to understand how encoding is done, how the instructions are executed, what the what the bytes actually mean when you look at them. And I never had time. No, there's always something else, something more important that needs to be done. And uh, when I went to SUSE, I had time. That doesn't mean <laughs> doesn't mean we work less at SUSE, but it means that uh, what actually happened is SUSE has this these things called Hack Week, where you get a week free, like paid time to work on a project you want to work on. And I was like, yeah, well, maybe that's the best time to start decoding instructions. So I, I, I kind of implemented object dump again. I mean, uh, people would say, why do you have to do that? Well, because, because it's fun. <laughs> and maybe, maybe after doing this, you're probably going to realize that if you start extending it and adding some stuff that is like really kernel related, you're probably going to help you enhance the kernel in certain sense. And you're going to see that in the second part. So let's start. Right, so it's it's split in two parts. The first one is, is an attempt to show how instruction encoding is done in x86. And then I'm going to try to show three different low level strategies and, and like maybe technology that that uses like the knowledge of instructions. It's really low level. I call them hot hacks. Make fun funky stuff. It's interesting. Right, so a little bit of history. So we can spend talking about this for a whole talk. So I'm just going to go through it. So 1971, Intel did a four by four uh, bit processor for, for a Japanese company called Busycom, and it was supposed to be part of a calculator. And, um, it was done by, um, mainly by Federico Fagin, who was one of the guys doing a lot of research on, 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 on uh, transistors at Fairchild Semiconductors. A year later, they did the 8-bit uh, CPU, and they had to use an instruction set that was designed by DataPoint. It's a company doing uh, CRT terminals. Two years later, they had to extend the instruction set, adding new instructions and changing instructions, and and they did the 8080 CPU and uh, also uh, an 8-bit CPU. But it's, it means that the assembly for the 80, 8008, so the first 8-bit CPU, was only source compatible. So you have to uh, translate the assembly for the 8080. Three years later, uh, 8085 changed the, the technology for 
for the laying out the MOSFETs, the transistors, so depletion load and MOS is a new technology. And uh, the 8085, uh, what's called 85, the 5 means only 5 wa volts of, of voltage supply. Before that, they had like 3. And it's, it was a big deal at the time. And the one year later, they did the 8086, which is actually it was a stopgap project because uh, they were competing with another company called Zyloc, which was found by Federico Fagin, who left Intel. And the Z80, which was a clone of the 8085, was, was doing really good. And they had to have something on the market before they release another processor, which is a 32-bit processor, which failed miserably. It's called APX432. And that thing got really delayed, so they had to do something. And the guy who, who did the 8086, the designer is called Steven Morse, and he was a software guy. So he actually applied the software approach to, 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 to hardware design. Maybe that, that was one of the reasons why 8086 succeeded. Yeah, so 8086, the first 86 CPU, 16-bit CPU with 16-bit external data bus. And um, that's a year later, maybe, right, when, when they had to do an 8088 CPU, which is actually the CPU that went into the uh, IBM PC because it was 8086, but the data bus connecting to the outside was split in, it was 8-bit external data bus, so you had to do two cycles on the bus. And you had to do it that b because the CPU was cheaper. And the designer of 8086 said that it's a castrated version. So this is the story. And after that, they started with 186, 286, and all those features. You can read everything on Wikipedia nowadays. Okay, so the instruction set architecture of x86, it is more or less backwards compatible to the first 86 CPU. Yeah, all the extensions added, added over the years recycle instructions, and you're going to see that later how. It's a hybrid CISC, so CISC is a complex instruction set uh, uh, computer, which means that one instruction in assembly gets split in multiple instructions executed by a machine. I say hybrid because there are some instructions in x86 which are actually mapped like one-to-one, -one, so one assembly instruction is mapped to one machine instruction. Why they do it? Because you, in, in hardware design, you want to be as, as, as optimal as possible. So if, if it makes sense to do some of the instructions CISC, you do CISC, and otherwise you do RISC. The ISO was the extension of the first uh, instruction set architectures of 80, 80, 08 and 8080. The, the, instru uh, the instructions are little endian and uh, they're of variable length in versus other architectures which have fixed length instructions which makes the decoder much easier to program in hardware. And uh, in x86, probably the guys were thinking about saving instruction bytes because if you, if you do it variable length, you have, you can save space in the instruction cache which is very, it's relatively small and you can make it faster this way. So the uh, variable length me means uh, it's the mouse. Yeah. So that's the the maximum size you can run without getting a general protection fault. So it's 15 bytes, 16 bytes, and you and you see this thing. So you trap. But most of the structures are much smaller than 15 bytes. Yeah, that's that's almost unreadable. So if you that that's a flowchart from the AMD application manual. It basically says the order and shows you the order how an instruction is 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 uh, laid out and what comes first and what comes after. And Intel have it too. It's much easier to understand. I mean, it's, what they left out the details. So first you have instruction prefixes. Then the opcode comes. Then there's a there's a mod RM byte. I'm going to explain all those afterwards. And uh, that byte is not mandatory, so sometimes you have it, sometimes it don't depend depends on opcode. Then the SIP byte. Then you have displacement and immediate values, and that's the instruction. That can be 15 bytes long, nothing more, not more. 
Uh, yeah, we have registers in x86. Uh, almost general purpose. So the first eight were, at, were added initially by Intel, then AMD when they did the 64-bit, they were really imaginative. They called them R8 to R R15. So it's eight more registers. All right, so the first the first thing that comes in uh, uh, with the instruction are the prefixes. You have multiple prefixes. If you want to do a lock, for example, you you express that with the lock prefix, which is 0F. And those are the repeat prefixes. So some instructions you can repeat multiple times. And you do that by adding those prefixes. Uh, the compiler does that all for you. And also the operand size overrides. Normally you have a, a default operand size, which means if you don't specify the operand size explicitly, you use the default one. And if you want to override that, you use the prefix 66. And then a couple of prefixes which you use to override segments. So if you do segment addressing and you add a prefix, you do uh, you address a different segment depending on the prefix. Those those are like getting reused, recycled slowly. And address size override too. Then the Rex prefix, which is a, a 16 prefix, is actually that was added by AMD. Uh, they went and recycled the a whole set of instructions called the ink increment and decrement instructions, single byte instructions, and on and 64 bit those instructions like they were 40 to 40f. That were the opcodes, and now in 64 bit those instructions those instructions are a prefix now. So if you want to address the 64-bit uh, registers or address the extended register like R8 to R15, you need the Rex prefix. And there are also encoding, encoding es escapes. It's like with um, the VEX and XOP, those are part of the AVX specification. And uh, with that escape, you can encode the instruction differently. Then after the prefix comes the opcode. It's a single byte denoting the basic operation. If it's a single byte, automatically means you have 256 uh, opcodes, but you have more instructions than that, which means you have to do some funky stuff. Let me show you. So yeah, it's hard to see, but this is the opcode map like the for the first byte. And both both the manuals into AMD have that. So if you go here, like the opcode zero, 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 add, and that's the code of offer and so on and so forth. Example the the four those are like the ink and vex instructions which were reused on 64 bit for the rex prefix. By the way, if there are questions, feel free to ask. Um, Right, so 256 uh, opcodes, but you, we, we definitely have more. So what we do is we escape, we use escape sequences. For example, if you encounter as a first opcode 0F, that's an escape sequence for the secondary opcode maps. And you have a couple of those. 0F, 0F is the 3D now, which is an AMD extension. It's probably not used anymore. 0F38, 0F3A, and so on. Those are primarily SSE instructions. 
And then you have the vex prefixes, which are two and the xop, which is another one. And those are like AVX, AVX, AS, FMA instructions, and so on. So when, when you encounter, encounter those bytes, you know that if you're in 64 bit, you escape to a different. So you have to switch in decoding. Right, so most of the manuals show the opcodes in hex, but actually it's much better to look them in octal because maybe the original design decision was to, 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 to make them in octal and because the initial architecture had eight, eight registers, so you can use an octal number to, this, to describe a register. And uh, you can even reuse some of the bits in the opcode to, to denote operation, like for example, the direction of operation, size of displacements, how the register encoding is done, so on. Basically, the idea is to save as much instruction bytes as, po as possible so that you have less stress on the instruction cache. For example, if we look at octal, the first octal group are arithmetical logical operations. So zero P something where P is in this range defines like zero one X is, are add instructions, zero, no zero zero, zero one are or instructions, zero two are add with carry and so on. The second group are ink and push and pop and so on. So you can, if you look at, at the instructions in Octo, you can, you can see how, how everything was really, really regular. Like here, for example. The last bit denotes the width. So zero, zero add is using eight bit operands. Then zero, one, which is opcode zero, one. The one, the last bit is using different size. So 16, 32, 64, depending on uh, operand size. And then the second bit shows the direction, which switches. So now you go from E, which is a register or memory, the source operand, and goes to, to a general purpose register. And again, the width bit is zero, which means it's eight bit size. And then width bit is one, and you have a larger size. And those are with the second number in octal zero. And then the second number in octal becomes one, and then you have the or instructions. So you can, you can see this regularity and so on. And this thing breaks later. So depending on which group defined the, extent, the, the instruction extensions, they did it differently. They, they have a different scheme. So, but this was the, the initial one. After the opcode, you have a mod RM, which is another byte. And you have three fields in that byte, and uh, with those fields you can describe, you can describe the uh, operation you're doing and the operands. And this says that because you do, uh, because with 64-bit you added, we uh, and you added uh, eight more registers, and uh, before that they used three bits to to select a register. They added another bit now because you have to be able to select four, uh, 16 registers, so it's like to the power, to the power four. And um, yeah, so those are the fields. So you have, if the mod, the first two bits are one, one, you have a register direct addressing. And if it's not three, like one, one binary, you have register indirect and then more specification comes after and the rec field selects a register based operand and the arm field selects either register or memory operand and it's combined with the mod field. For example, if you want to say that after the mod RM there's a SIP byte coming, you have to have, for example, this configuration. The mod has to be zero, which means a register indirect mode and RM has to be five. This is how the addressing is done. Uh, like how to tell the decoder what's coming. The SIP byte, which is uh, used for scale index base addressing, you're gonna see examples later, 
is also similarly split. So you have index and base, and those both uh, select index and base registers, and the scale is the scale to, uh, one, two, four, or eight you, you use for offsetting. Yeah, so scale factor, index. We also add another bit from the Rex to extend the index field because, of course, we have 16, 16 registers and we need another bit. And this, is happen this happens with the base. So the effective address you get is you get the scale multiplied by the index at the base and the offset. So if you have an instruction like this one, this is the, the, the SIP. This is told by the SIP byte. So the SIP byte deciphers this. For example, <coughs> uh, the base address is uh, RBX and it has the value 3. So you, 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 you uh, enumerate the registers RAX, then Strangely enough, it's not RBX, but RCX, then RDX and RBX. So that's why that's, that's free. And, and the, the other operand, the, the, the source operand, is encoded is in with, with, with the field of monorail. It's just an example. There are people who actually look at the bytes and know what's going on. The code in, in their head. Then the display, the displacement follows. In this case, we have it here. Like four bytes. <coughs> and um, it can be absolute or relative. It is one, two, or four bytes. And in 64-bit mode, it's extended to to 64-bit. Sign extended because we don't have eight bytes displacement. And then the immediates, immediates come. They are like at the end of the instruction and they can be one, two, four, or eight. And uh, the also sign extended. And there are certain instructions where you can move a full 64 bit value into the register. And for that, you don't have a modern or, or anything. You just have the output, and you look at the output of VA. Register of VA, and then you need it. Right, so this is the, 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 the Rex prefix, which, is the, which was the 64-bit <coughs> extension. There's only one uh, prefix allowed in the instruction, and it has to come before the opcode, like immediately before. You can have other prefixes before, then Rex, and then the opcode. When it's meaningless, it just gets ignored. It doesn't mean anything in the instruction. And yeah, I already told you this. Like, they, when when they were designing this, they had to they had to recycle some instruction bytes. So they they des they decided to use the inks and decks. So you you had to have like a full set of 16, 16 uh, uh, contiguous bytes, instruction bytes, which you can recycle. And uh, the Rex is split this way. So the first four, the first four bits are four. That's why it starts with zero, four, 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 four yet. Yeah. And then you use the last four bits for denoting the width and uh, the additional bits for the one arms and sit bytes. Right, and uh, Rex enabled 64-bit virtual addresses in RIPs and 64-bit physical addresses, although the actual width is dependent on the implementation of the processor depending on how much physical memory you can address. You have flat address space, no segmentation, and the GPRs are widened to 64-bit. The, the default operand size is 32-bit. So when you, when you don't override that, you, you get by default 32-bit operands on, 64, uh, on, on AMD64. And they get sign extended 64-bit if required. For example, if you... This is the operand size prefix. So if you have a, if you want to add a 16 bit uh, operand, you have to add that operand size override uh, prefix for 40. So it's a 66 
six Rex and then if you don't have that and you have a Rex perfect, the operand size is determined by the call segment divot. And if you set the the, the W to fit to one, you get six four. For example, Rex sixty-six uh, operand size override and off call. Yeah, we talked about this already too. So eight new G general purpose registers, you need that. Uh, in order to address those, you need to use one bit. So one bit, e bit each. So that's why the second part of the RECs are, are those three bits, ARCs and B. Right, so R X, the R bit extends modern and reg, and the RECs, the X extends the, the index, and the B extends the base or RM. So, for example, you can do uh, you can address the lower the lower eight bytes, eight bits of of every register with sixty four bits. So you wouldn't you wouldn't let you work you was able to address it before uh, with a uh, and this is like part of the extension. What else? Oh yeah, and also they added the XMM, like the SSC, SSC registers of additional eight, XMM eight to 15. Uh, let's do some examples. So if you do, if you do move RX, RBX, the width bit is set to one, so you get 64 bit register. If you don't set the width bit or you don't supply RX per, if you want to address the extended register, the, the added one, you have to set you have to set each bit for for source and destination. So the B bit and the R bit are set to the first. So where it becomes one that's one and then uh, an eight is a nine and so on. And that's a zero to one. So one it's 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 the most significant bit. Now it's eight. So and if you want to do the same thing with virtual bit values, you just clear the width. You still have Rex, you have to, because you have to have the extended register, you need the Rex reference. But you clear the W bit. So the Rex reference becomes 45, now it's 14, and this 48. This shows like how you need to have all the 16 records, all, all, all the 40 to 40 F prefixes B1. Logical prefix called Rex. What else? Oh yeah. Eight bit register RRC, which you're now able to address in in the other one. So that means that all the rest of them. The same thing with the extended register, so you have to set one of the bits. And if you want to address the, the high eight bits of A, X, B, X, B, X, B, X, you don't, you cannot do that with the rest of the three to go to What the Rex prefix also added is RIP relative addressing. And in, in, in legacy mode, you, you have that only in control transfers, like it jumps. Now, with Rex prefix, you can address, you can, you can do all this fun stuff with, uh, with a position independent code or addressing global data, which makes it much, much easier. And, uh, it looks like this. So, low effective address, which is a data offset from RIP in priority, and RIP is computed by computing the address of the next address. <coughs> So how it's done, you, you can add a four byte sign displacement, which is plus minus three bytes to the 64 bit next trip. So you have to compute the next trip, so you have to decide this is first to first. And then you add the offset, and this is how you, you do the memory access to the It's much easier to do that than like before, because you use 
this type of addressing in the in the cloud. This is the type of code. Is that this is the first instruction in the game when In order to specify the uh, RIP content addressing, we need to say mod zero or an part. I'm going to jump over that. So that's AVX. It's a completely different story. So it's a, it's a three byte addressing, and those map selects are actually. Ways like you have five bits to select the optical map, which is a denser <coughs> than the way they used to select the standard optical maps for four bytes. Yeah. 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 There's also the, the two byte version. Yeah, yeah, cool structure. There, then there's this thing called AVX 512. So now we have. 32 registers, each 512 bit size. Another prefix, 62, which used to be the bound instruction in legacy mode and it's invalid in 64 bit mode. There are also mask registers, eight of them. A lot of fun. You can look at the, you can look it up into the uh, software development of Intel and see the whole definition. Okay, questions? No. Okay. So um, yeah. So um, yes. What x86 opcode is? Ugly? <laughs> <laughs> that too. Because I used to write a complete code. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For for this optimization, yeah. or for for this way of defining it. Yeah. Well, I think for, for this case, they wanted to save as much space as possible. So you can reuse bits of the upcode. You know? Uh, 
Yeah. Right. So I think that the, 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 the decision is done by hardware designers. So they don't sit down and say, well, we have to make it nice so that assembly coders can can have fun. It, it has to be as fast as possible and save us as many uh, transitions as possible. So yeah, you reuse as much as possible. I think that's the that's the like maybe the 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 thing that that holds true for thirty years now, more. Which one? Sure. Yeah. Like the eight bit instructions? You mean the first, for example, zero zero? Yeah. Sure, that's still used. Yeah, that's generated. No, no, that's a normal instruction. But you can execute that on the first Intel too. On the first eighty six CPU. Yeah. So backwards compatibility was also it is still all very important. You know, you know, we all know about the Itanium. <laughs> yeah, Itanic, exactly. Okay, so yeah, and I, when I was doing that, I was, I had, I had this thing running more or less, and uh, decoding. Bin LS, the binary. I was like, "What now?" And I said, "Well, maybe I can decode VM Linux, the the, the ready executable, and try to show something in there, like some some interesting stuff, because we do a lot of interesting stuff with VM Linux or like in the kernel." So this is the second part. Try to tries to show some some interesting techniques, maybe maybe for you too. First of all, the first one is alternatives. So there's this technique in the kernel. I, X86 has it, and ARM is getting it too. And I don't know about <coughs> others, where you boot the binary and you replace some instructions or uh, like one or more with other instructions. For example, if you detect a CPU which has support for that instruction for for a certain operation which you actually no, uh, normally do in software you actually want to replace that operation done in software you want to replace it with the hardware instruction because the hardware instruction is always faster and this is done with 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 alternatives you're going to see examples after this for example one of the examples is uh when we online a second cpu and we turn it into a smp kernel we go and patch all the locks, all the spin locks, because a UP kernel, like a single process kernel, it, you don't have to lock explicitly on x86 at least, you just disable preemption. And wh when you enable a second CPU and you turn, a, you turn an SMP kernel, you need to lock when you spin lock. You need a, 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 a hardware lock. And this is also done with, with, with alternatives. So you patch all the spin locks positions, you add the lock prefix. Uh, it just, yeah. For example, other, another example is uh, if you do RDPSC, which is read the time stamp counter, so the CPU has a counter which can command monophonically, and you want to read it, nothing guarantees that the read is not going to happen before or after the instruction because uh, the x86 is a very, very powerful out of order machine, and it can, it can run the RDTSCP, like RDTSC, read the TSC before the instructions in the instruction stream. So you can get, you can possibly get, get a, a, a value which, which, which is from before or after. And in order to synchronize that, you need to use another instruction around it. That's NSEN. And that's an AMD. But on Intel and C4, you need to use Alpha. And we patch the function, the RDTSC direct, so when you put the kernel on a on an AMD, you patch this into a, this turns into an NSEN or an Intel it turns into an Alpha. A good thing about it is you can use one one kernel image for putting a memory machine. So the distros when they deliver kernel image, it's only one image, one to the other. And depending on what you put it on, it still runs optimal. 
It comes with a lot of different bug workarounds with uh, alternatives. For example, this is a bug in old Intel Epic, where you had to, if you, in order to read the, in order to write into the Epic, you have to read it first. So this thing goes and replaces the write into the Epic with each change. So, you can read. so basically, you get this. We're going to try to optimize the generic kernel as well as optimally as possible on any hardware. Example, <laughs> right, so there's this uh, instruction called, okay, there's this function called h weight, so you can compute the Hamming weight of a bit field, which means count all the bits which are one. And uh, the default function we have is this crazy thing. And uh, at some point, an instruction called pop count was implement, implemented, this one which does exactly the same. So basically you want to go and replace this whole function with an invocation of pop count because this is going to run faster. And uh, the Hamming weight is, uh, is used often in CPU mask weight and stuff like that. So the more, the, the more often you use a, 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 a function and uh, the, the more you win if you replace it with a hardware version because the hardware version is going to be definitely we're running, is running faster. So how do you define that? So you define an alternative macro and you say if the CPU has the pop count, which is the feature bit, replace the call to the software version of pop count with the instruction itself. It's, that, it's very easy. So what happens is when the, when the machine starts, it goes and takes, so it detects the CPU has a pop count, has support for the pop count instruction, takes the pop count instruction and overwrites the call. And you can see it's nicely of the same size, so the call is five bytes and the pop count is five bytes, so it fits nicely into the instruction stream. This is what the alternatives do, more or less. Oh yeah, and, and I implemented this into my tool to show all the replacements, that's at the top. All the replacements of this means at this virtual address, in the DM Linux, we have this instruction, and when this feature bit is set, we take this instruction from this virtual address and put it over here. How do you do that in code? Oh yeah, let's first do another example. So this is more involved. Uh, we have this uh, function called static CPU has saves as a way to test whether a CPU feature support is there. But you want to test that as fast as possible. So you don't want to, if, you, if it, this happens in, in, in a very, in a hot path, you want to run this as fast as possible. So you don't want to, you, if, if possible, you don't want to test the bit every time you want to reorder the instruction stream so whenever a feature is there you want to execute that code first and return you're going to see that in an example but before you want to te you want uh, before testing cpu features with this function like this, you, know, you need to run alternatives but you know Kernel guys sometimes go and use this function much very, very early before alternatives have run. So we need a safe variant, and the safe variant goes and, and, and does the slow version, which tests the bit. And after the alternatives run, the replacement is done, you have the fast variant. And this function wraps everything in, in it. This is an example in the code. So for example, if you say, Am I using eager FPU? I do static CPU has safe. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is the, the definition. Basically, what you do is th that's the same error. So initially when the machine starts, that's that code is there. So that's a jump to here and runs the, the same version. So this is always going to succeed. When the alternatives run, we do 
two replace we, we do replace it twice. So we do first replace the jump to here to with the jump to this one to say we don't have the feature, say false. And then if we detect the feature later, we replace the jump to here with nothing. And at the end of the day, you have. Yeah. So this is the code. This is switch two. So when you initially run, if you run this for 40 instructions and run, you have this jump. And this jump to 90, 490, <coughs> which is the, 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 the save. So we call it save. That's by default. That's before. We record we run on terms, but this is always going to succeed, and you always you can be sure that you're always going to get the right result. And when the first jump is replaced, you jump to 49E, which is after the save, which is the uh, uh, which is the, the case where we don't have the feature support. And you can see this is in the back of the code, like it's, that, it's further down. And if we want to, if we detect the CPU feature, we replace this instruction with nothing, and this jump is gone, so we go ahead and do this one. With the layout of the code, we made it this way so that you first execute the likely code. The likely code comes first, so you don't have a jump, you don't stress first to victim, you don't do anything. So this is the, the optimal situation. And if you don't have a feature, you're going to have to just jump. But Again, it's a likely code, which means most of the cases is going to have this. So only a very small amount of CPUs, like all CPUs, are probably going to have the feature. So they're going to they're going to just jump. And jump is sometimes more expensive than the majority. How is this done? So we put enough information into the kernel binary so that we can do we can do the replacements. We use Two sections, L sections, alt instructions and alt instructions replacement. The alt instructions contains these structures, so it has the offset to the original instruction, and then it has the offset to the instruction we want to replace, and we have this feature bit which we test, and then we have the the original instruction length and the replacement length. We want to we want to check whether lengths are, are matching. And when the linker generates VM Linux, it computes the proper offsets for here. So we go and get the address of this structure where we load it at because we need to support um, uh, relocatable kernels and KASLR. So we don't know on which offset we're loaded. So we have to be we have to be relative. So we get the address of this thing and we add it to this offset and we get to the address of the original instruction. And this is how we do the replacement. Right. So something else I was thinking about while doing the tool is like um, doing elf editing. Well, the, the, state, the state area is ugly because we have to enforce the size of the jump. It has to E9 is a jump four byte, the four byte offset, which makes the instruction five bytes. Can we make it small? Can we make the jump like two bucks? Because there's a version EB which does jump uh, sign eight bit offset. So if you have a two byte offset instead of, instead of a five byte, which does maybe make it work. We don't know, maybe not. But it's still fun to see whether that's going to work. So can we do this? Can we just use jump the mnemonic? The and the compiler decides what upload to, to emit. Uh, can I can I have <laughs> right? So we need to control the jump versions and the current solutions. We, we just say we're going to do five byte jumps. Jump is a single byte and s uh, uh, sign thirty two bit offset, so five byte. But can we make them smaller so that we can lower the instruction cache load? And what we can do is we can parse the VM Linux after it's done and replace those instructions at build time, not at runtime. And I have a prototype that's. That's part of this thing. So we have, we're already parsing ELF anyway. I have a prototype and it works almost. So, 
to show what I mean. So I'm, I'm, I'm using Michael to show the difference because it's very, it's very helpful for case like that. Like, otherwise, you have to actually come and go to the offsets and look and is that right or not. So what we're going to do is we have a two byte jump and we have a five byte jump and we're going to say go and replace the two byte with the two byte. So you have lost in that. So this is saving on the second. And this can be done. And yeah, so I diff the output. And what happens, most of the cases, you replace a 5 by time with a 4 by time, or the best one is a 5 by time with a 2 by time. So you set up the same, the same instruction to string. But there's a problem, for example. Sometimes it doesn't work. Like you, you, have, a, you have a 2 by jump, you have a 5 by jump, and if you compute the offset, that doesn't fit in the, in the sign A bit, into a sign Y. So you have to generate a 2 byte jump, and that's 4 bytes. And if you go and take this instruction and override this instruction with it, you're going to override the beginning of the next instruction, then you screw it. So you, you have to come up with a way to, of adding knots, like, like conditional knots, like when this instruction is bigger than this one, you have to add so many knots. And this has to be done with, with the linker. And that's, yeah, so I've been using my tool to show all this. So wh what I'm saying is you can, I did it because it's easier, it enables developing stuff like that because you can dump the instructions, say, see exactly what changes. And before that, you had to do object dump. And it was, yeah, you can, you can, you can do a script that does that for you. But it's much it's nicer to write the tool because you can you have to learn the instruction encoding. Something else which is similar, exception tables. Oh, uh, questions? You say that it's a, the optimal case is when you use a, the feature. Yep. That means as you as you add new instruction and you use new CPU features, other No, no, you only switch to the, to the faster instruction only on the CPUs which have that support. On the other CPUs, you just normal. So the other CPUs don't lose. They just have whatever they have. More or less, yeah, more or less. <laughs> Yeah, right. So alternatives. I, yeah, the question is whether whether the, you should be rather com contributing to compiler development. So for alternatives, when you patch on runtime, you cannot do that because the compiler doesn't know what, on what CPU the machine is going to run, uh, the, the the kernel. So for that, you need live patching. It has to happen at runtime. When you boot and see, okay, I'm running on this machine. Oh, okay, I have this feature, so I'm going to patch it now. For the elf editing. Uh, you can do that in a compi uh, with a compiler, sure, yeah. But you have to learn the compiler. <laughs> really? So the question is whether you can simply patch some instructions on some machines where you know where that actual instruction is slower, right? So you can you can define a feature depending on the family model stepping in the CPU. Okay, you can can I show? You? Right. So this is the this is the feature bit. You can define a feature feature bit that says on this CPU this is faster. And, and, and set that bit during boot um, only to those families, only to those family models, and then they return to the pickup. And this is how we boot it, by the way. 
So we said that, for example, the, the epic fix, that's, that's family model stepping based, where you, oh, where is it? Yeah, this one. So what for this and So this bit is that of only in for a certain time. Okay. More questions. Oh, there's one. Yeah. There's also there's also a provision to replace uh, instructions in modules. Yes. Okay. So this is a similar technique. It's basically a way to say, I'm going to try to execute this, and I'm not sure whether I'm going to succeed, but I'm I'm going to go to a fix up code if I don't succeed because I'm sure that this is not going to destroy the processor state so I can I can safely switch to a fix up it's like a way of doing exceptions in the kernel so for example when you execute a, a when you execute a certain instruction and you get one of those exceptions we have different exceptions we run to a, cer uh, a, a certain exception tables which, which, which say, if you fault on this address, go and execute this. So they're like metrics. And uh, while well, we use it, we use it for accessing process address space. So get user, put user uses that. If you fault on a access to user space because the page is not mapped or something, there's a fix up code for that. This is the, 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 the most prominent example. And then, for example, if you do read MSR on, address, on, on MSR that's not existent, you can do fix-up code. So basically everywhere where you can safely recover. How is this done? Similar, in a similar way, you, you, you write down, so you, you generate exception table entries with the mappings between the extraction you fault on and the fix-up. And you when you fix up due to a fault, you get the address of this and add the offset. The same with the alternatives. And you jump to the fix up. This is done by fix up except, uh, exception. So a fix up exception, when it finds a valid address to where, where it's supposed to fault, it puts the fix up address into the rip and then Rex IP, and then we say that we fixed, and we return to, to the to the code that raised the instruction. This is an example. So it's again safe. There is a possibility of x86 to fall when you read the MSR, like the most specific register, and it says if you fall here, jump here, and return back. So what the code does is. Read MSR, machine falls if the MSR is not existing or hidden or whatever. And the fault handler goes over the goes over the exception table, which is imagine the exception table. Two B means the address of this, two values. And two B means the address of this, so it's the instruction and fix up. So you read MSR, you fault, you find the address where you fault it in the exception table. I found, which means I can handle it. You go to the fix up code, which is this label. So you write the AIO into the, into the error code, and then return it after this instruction. And you return the error. This is how it looks. It's basically the same thing. You also use a, 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 a different table, exception table, which is away from the code, from the normal. Yep. How many people in the is about this exception? Oh, there. I think there are enough people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, yeah, I know. But it's fun. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I did this in Mito, so it says if you if you faulted this address, that's the instruction, and this is the fix up. So the AIO, and this is that's put user, 
and put user again for eight bytes. Yeah. There's uh, another uh, technique called jump labels. This is used for trace points. So if you do perf tracing and stuff like that, you want to put you want to put the tracing code out of line. So normal function, uh, a play uh, empty space of five bytes, then the tracing code. Oh, I'm over time. Huh? Continue. Huh? Okay, I'm going to do it faster. Yeah, so um, you use a certain machinery in, in GCC called ASM, ASM GoTo. The same with the same with the alternatives. The CPU has safe. And when you ha enable a trace point at runtime, you go and add a jump in the likely code to the tracing code. Can I show it? Right. So this is this is how this is how it looks in C. Basic says if I have a stable schedule, which is RTC, I, if I have stable schedule, uh, I, I do RTC, and otherwise I do schedule, which is GPU. And this is the assembly that gets added. And also use another structure to, to describe this. Okay. So this is the, the, the function. This is the, how the assembly works. So you enter the function, you have a five bytes of not, and this is the lightning code that happens. And when you enable the jump label, you override this not with a jump and you jump over here. It's an, it's another way of of optimizing fast path. Yeah, there's something we need to do, but I don't have time for this. Okay, that's it.